And so I want you guys to give a warm welcome to our next speaker, Hope. Yeah. Yeah. It says in verse 3, 
As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the signs of your coming and of the end age? Moving to verses 6 and 7, you see that Jesus responds by giving them the exact answers and signs leading up to the end times. He says this, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are just the beginning of birth pains. Now I thought about this, just the beginning of birth pains. So what, what else could possibly be the end of times? Like if these are just the beginning, what else would there be? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, it gives us a better understanding of what people will be like in those times. It says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy without love, unforgiving, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than loving lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. You see, it's that last verse that gets me every time. Have nothing to do with them. I think many times in this time of age in churches, and people misunderstand that verse and take it all too literally. You see, it says have nothing to do with them, but I don't see in that verse where it says don't love them. You see, what you don't see in this verse is that God was saying we aren't to partake in their ways, but we are to love them and share the gospel just like I did. You see, the Bible calls us to be just like Jesus. If we even act just a little bit like Jesus, imagine the sunflower and how fruitful it can be. Which leads me to my last point today. We will never know the day and hour that Christ will come, so we must be ready. If you look back to Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 38, it states this. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. You see, this verse talks about when Christ comes back that it will be as the times leading up to the flood. So in Genesis 6-5, it says the Lord saw how the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were only evil all of the time. You see, those who lived in the days of Noah were warned, and judgment eventually came to those who ignored the warnings and ignored the signs, and when it came, it came suddenly and unexpected. Therefore, we must be ready for the coming of Christ in an hour that we do not expect, because he will come without warning. I believe this to be so true, because upon my research, I have found that there are 1,645 biblical references to the second coming of Christ found throughout the entire Bible. Among the New Testament alone, I I found that approximately one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament teaches our Christ's return. You see, God wasn't just telling us about his coming for a second time. He was quite literally making it impossible for us to ignore the fact that he is coming back when his timing is right. In Matthew 24, 39, it seems this. And they knew nothing about what happened until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of man. The Son of Man. Then if you move into verse 24 or 40, it says, Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding in a hand, but one will be taken and the other left. When Jesus was saying this to his disciples, he was telling them that when he comes back, not everybody's going with him. Only those who choose to follow his word, who choose to say yes to Jesus, choose to be disciples that he's calling us to be. So if you take one thing away from my sermon, let it be this. 
The most dangerous lie that Satan can ever try to tell you is that there is no hurry. That's a lie. God is coming back, believe it or not. And when he comes back, we're not going to know. So if we're not being like a sunflower in our entire growing season, is preparing ourselves, preparing others for his return, then what are we doing? Remember this. It doesn't matter if people make you uncomfortable. It doesn't matter if they're not your kind of people. It doesn't even matter if they like you. People didn't like Jesus. People needed him. God calls us to be disciples. So as I close out my sermon today, I want to leave you with two important questions to think about. One, what are you doing to prepare yourselves and others for the second coming of Christ? And two, if Christ's second coming came tomorrow, would you leave satisfied knowing that you help plant seeds in others around you? If you don't like your answer, what are you going to do to change it? Thanks. That's good. That was beautiful. That was amazing. Let's give it a round of applause.